So how do we do it? How do we go up against these clearly serious, these are serious odds. You're the little one in this picture. How do we put the fox, uh, how do we get him to put a lock on the hen house, which is the, that's the, that's the, the problem with this issue more than any other issue. And how do we get away from these perennial headlines in January, literally every time Congress comes back into session? How do we create a government that looks less like this and more like this? How do we win? There's three metaphors I'll give you. One would be a chessboard. We have to look at, I, I, I'm going to challenge all of you to really look at this problem that we're dealing with as a game of chess or look at it as getting to the top of Mount Everest. With chess, you have to fill the gaps. You've got to figure out the moves that haven't been done yet that might actually get you a win. With Everest, if you've got enough gear, if you've got enough resources, why not send several different teams up different routes of the mountain, all of you trying to get to the top? Or if you're doing a, an innovation like is happening right now around building the electric car, how do you build an electric car that will go for 1,000 miles on one charge, and, and how, how can you actually innovate so that you have a sustainable environment. So I speak tonight as just one humble electric car. I wanted to do the Tesla, but I didn't think it would be appropriate. So I'm just the Honda Fit. But I tell you that I came up with six strategic assumptions. Number one, politicians will only act if forced to. That is why Larry Lessig's Mayday Pack is so important because we finally get it and then we finally have leadership that could actually make that happen, where politicians think, you know, we actually have to think about what we're going to do before we act because we might lose office. We need to stop looking so much like this, and we need to start acting more like this. Why does the NRA have power? Because they make it very clear, if you're not with us, you're out of office. And the other thing we have to accept is the fact that the two major parties are not going to ever embrace real reform. Get over it. They might, the Democrats might talk about it, but when it comes time to acting, they will not act on substantive reform. They too, like the Republicans, are too entrenched. Number two, political leverage requires a movement. Dan Miller talked about this. The insurmountable odds that we're facing right now are not new. They were faced by the suffragettes. They were faced by Martin Luther King. They were faced by gay rights or marriage equality advocates. They were faced by environmentalists in the 1960s. They are faced today by the climate, uh, the climate change activists who are doing incredible work, including September 21st, New York. That's tomorrow. Let's not forget about that. But this is actually doable because all these groups understand far more than ever that they are not going to make progress in this. We win. Larry Lessig's message that this needs to be your first issue is finally starting to really resonate. Number three, the movement must be transpartisan. I cannot emphasize this enough. This chart, 22 years of data. How do you self-identify? 41% conservative, 35% moderate. Just 21% of Americans self-identify liberal. Yet this issue has been relegated to the political left for too long, and it doesn't have to be. Over three-quarters of conservatives want to see Citizens United reversed, more moderates and even more liberals. That means it's time for strange bedfellows. Get used to it. It's absolutely critical. It is time to get in bed with people that you don't agree on abortion and gay marriage with. Deal with it. Deal with it. And it's being done. Speaking of gay marriage, that's Ted Olson, conservative lawyer, represented George W. Bush against uh, v, uh, Bush v. Gore for the election recount, standing there for gay marriage on Proposition 8 or against Proposition 8 in California. Number four, we need bold, comprehensive reforms. This guy said it well, as usual. Money in politics is a cancer, but cancer doesn't cure itself, and it won't be cured by tiny little ideas. You need ideas, you need reforms that inspire and transform the system, and you have to avoid this real problem in this issue area, which is that false victories can actually set you back farther than just about on any issue. People think, right? Oh, McCain-Feingold, it's all done. We fixed that problem. Number five, it's corruption stupid. This is, the, uh, this is a field test when you talk about campaign finance reform. That's literally what happens. It's, uh, it's the best thing to put you to sleep if you have a, a problem with that. And this often cited poll from two years ago uh, when 1,000 Americans were asked what's the most important issue for Obama or Romney when they were, they were running for the re-election uh, or the last election in 2012. Corruption in government came second only to um, 
jobs, and then we saw terrorism, healthcare, education, and all these other crucial issues that ranked below it. And here's the more important point. When you replace money and campaign finance with corruption, you get a 21% jump in support for the, you know, for reforms, for politicians who support those issues, and amongst conservatives, 30%. Look at that graph. If you talk about corruption and not money, not democracy, not campaign finance, you get a 30% jump in the number of conservatives, percentage of conservatives who think it's very important that reform happen. Number six, think nationally, win locally. So really quick recap, politicians have to be forced. We have to build a movement. It has to be right-left. It has to be in favor of bold, real reforms. It's all about corruption, and you have to think nationally, win locally. But for now, at the moment, as Dan said, it's about building a movement and winning locally. And a lot of people say, well, build a movement. Yeah, right. Or it's a mission impossible, but we're dealing with a cancer. And when you have cancer, you don't just take a lot of Tylenol. You, don't, you have to actually do some real work. It means chemo, radiation. It means changing your diet. And this is something that I think advocates have been unwilling to embrace until the last few years. And it is 2014. So the question is, how do you build a movement in 2014? And I'm just going to give you a quick sense of this, and then we're going to wrap up, and I think we're going to be able to network in the, in the lobby. Is that right, Dan? So here's how you do it in 2014. We are not in the pre-internet era. We are not in the early internet era when you could send a few emails from a few satellite offices and have seven million people on your list and have real power. We have uh, email fatigue, we have petition fatigue, and we have serious ADD. So I would submit to you that today we need a hybrid model of advocacy in this country. And that means a combination of grassroots organizing, viral and social multimedia, and state and local policy wins. Okay, now, grassroots organizing, real quick. These guys have managed to stop Keystone XL so far, not because they asked nicely, but because they hit the streets. And we're starting to see that on this issue finally. We did the K Street 5K, a couple years ago, we saw an amazing band of folks in California walk from LA to Sacramento this year. You might not have even heard of it. As Larry said, we had this incredible group of people in New Hampshire in January, and we've done some creative stuff as well. It's throwing fake money on the heads of the most corrupt legis state legislatures in the country. That's me in the upper left thinking I was getting arrested. I put my arms behind me thinking it was over, but he, we still haven't gotten arrested doing this so-called money fumble, a controversial uh, 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 effort that we did against the, let's see, he's a, a member of Congress. He had literally just co-sponsored and passed a law in the House. Uh, fortunately, it did not pass in the Senate that would literally put the American taxpayer back on the hook to bail out the largest banks if derivatives get messed with again. So we did this. Well, on HR 992, we really appreciate it. So I lobby on behalf of uh, Citibank. Oh, crap. Crap. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Crap, crap, crap. I was hoping we could have done this in private. Oh, God. Thank you. Here, why don't you just take, um, you can carry, carry whatever you can. That's fine. You get the idea, but that, that, that little money, we call it the money fumble, that went all over the state of Connecticut, where this congressman's, congressman's from, and you went from having 0.1% of all of his constituents knowing that he actually was doing these kinds of shenanigans in Congress in their name, and you went up to about 10% just with doing these creative actions. We saw what happened just recently, filing millions of signatures against, uh, against the, the, the problem with Citizen United and backing the Senate's decision to actually vote to overturn it. There were a lot of, of election year politics, but it was an impressive organizing effort around a constitutional amendment effort that has been amazing. 500 local government resolutions, 158 members of Congress backing a constitutional amendment, 2 million petitions, 16 states and Washington, D.C. have called for a constitutional amendment. And then you have state and local work. And what I'm going to submit to you, what's the core of our work, is actually trying to emulate the amazing political strategy by marriage equality, and by marijuana legalization. These are issues that 20 years ago were getting nowhere in Washington. So they said, let's go to the states, let's go to the cities, and let's redraw 
the political map of America with real reform. And that's what we're doing with the American Anti-Corruption Act. This is not what we've done. I wish it was. This is where we're looking to go. This year, in the city of Tallahassee, Florida, we have an Anti-Corruption Act on the ballot. Thank you. And on the ballot in Ta Tallahassee, Florida, where we are field testing this idea of moving a bold legislative proposal that deals with ethics, it overhauls ethics and lobbying, transparency and oversight, and citizen funding or public funding of elections. And it does it in essentially what you call everything you can fit within the so-called single subject rule. And what I mean by that, if I can go wonky for a second, is that whenever you try to pass a, a law, either in a city or a state, at the ballot, it has to be one single subject. You can't overhaul the entire legisl uh, you know, every, every law on the books. So we fit everything you can fit in without it getting thrown out on that rule. And what you find is, even keeping with current Supreme Court precedent, as has been mentioned tonight, it's remarkable what you can do without amending the U.S. Constitution. We're talking about banning politicians from raising money from interests they regulate saying they can't raise money during congressional business hours, uh, saying that redefining who and what is a lobbyist so that you can't have Tom Daschle and Newt Gingrich saying they're historical advisors, changing the revolving door from one year in the House and two years in the Senate to five years, to creating small-dollar citizen-funded elections. We do $25 uh, democracy voucher in cities, $50 democracy vouchers in states, and a $100 democracy voucher at the federal level. Um, making enforcement actually happen. Uh, really banning coordination between super PACs and candidates, which today is a joke, even though that is what the Supreme Court predicated their, or justified their, their Citizens United decision on. Uh, so there's a whole lot of these things that can actually be not only done constitutionally, but they can be packaged up into one proposal, and if you pass it, it's a complete game changer, and it's, in it's insanely popular. 89% in a national poll are supportive. In Montana, a relatively conservative state, 81% of all voters, and get the red bar, 83% of Republicans, 85% of Democrats. The innovation is, if you will, taking the more popular stuff, the ethics reforms, the lobbying reforms, the transparency rules, putting them in the front of the parade and putting the citizen funding, which is harder to understand and easier to attack by opposition, and kind of putting it a little more tactfully in the back of the parade. And if you do that, you have something that's far more marketable and passable than any other public funding or citizen funding proposal that's preceded it. And there's other good ideas, too. I mean, the constitutional amendment, as, as Professor Lessig pointed out, it faces huge hurdles. Two-thirds of the Congress, three-quarters of the states have to ratify. But you talk to any person in this country who was working on the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s, which didn't ultimately pass, but if you talk to any one of them, they will tell you that fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment was essential to the fight for women's rights. And then, of course, you have May Day, which is doing this absolutely crucial crucial operation, which I see as the other side of the coin to what our organization is doing, and that's getting politicians on the record and creating a more meaningful binary. Because Democrat, Republican doesn't mean much anymore. But anti-corrupt or sort of part of the DC status quo, that means a whole lot more. And then finally, going to the multimedia. I'm just going to submit to folks, it's so important that we get out of our heads and we get out of our intellectual mindset and that we start thinking about everything we do in the way of communication as being about the heart, about humor, about fear, about sadness, about tuning in to the things that the American people are actually feeling about their country, about the world, and about this issue. Uh, one thing you might have seen is Honest Gil Fulbright. Who's heard of Honest Gil Fulbright? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to play the tape because the, the, the hour is late, but he's awesome. He's going back to Kentucky today. He's going to be giving a speech tomorrow at a fair. He's going to be in a parade. He's going to NASCAR with his corporate benefactors logos all over his NASCAR suit. And we're trying to just make it connect to the folks uh, who really care about the issues that are being affected by this. So think about this. This is the last thing I'm going to say. It's a puzzle. Every different piece is a different piece of the puzzle. It's not a competition, but it is incumbent upon you to look at all the different 
things that are happening out there in the way of efforts to fix this problem and figure out the ones that resonate with you the most, which ones you think actually have the greatest uh, chance of winning, and really dive in, no matter what it is. And do it with sort of what I call existential humility. And what I mean by that is, this is going to be a long fight. It's going to be, it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, it could be 30 years, and even if it's 50 years, it's all right. It's okay if the next generation or the next generation are the ones that stand there and wave the victory flag, because the fact is, is the first civil rights organization was founded in this country, the first formal uh, civil rights organization was in the 1890s. The Civil Rights Act didn't pass until 1864, and that fight continues today. Did I say 1864? Yeah, sorry. The hour is late. So, it is a mission impossible. It can seem that way. It can seem like trying to fit this, this drum in this small door, but the reality is, and the reason you guys are all here late, is this really is like an asteroid coming towards Earth. And when we figure out what we're going to do about it and which cause, which effort we're going to fight with, it's a little bit like that stupid movie, Armageddon. Sorry, sorry, Matt, or whoever, Ben Affleck. But the reality is, is at a certain point, the president had to say, all right, well, that's the least crazy idea for getting that asteroid to stop, you know, coming at the earth and, and ending it as we know it. And I'm going to go with these guys. And if we do that, we together will climb that mountain to victory. Thank you.